I think the, uh, the bringing together was mostly fate, don't you, Carlos? I would say that's true. I was in uh, I was in Wayne killing some time downtown, and I walked into a store, and uh, there was Carlos painting, and I was struck by the paintings, mm -hmm. and I remember walking over and rubbernecking the paintings, and, and uh, Carlos was busy at his easel, and uh, after several minutes he wiped his hands and stopped and came over and introduced himself. We began to talk and that was about it. Um, I was uh, so impressed with those paintings. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not very knowledgeable about visual art, but I sure do know what I like. <laughs> and I liked so many of the things that I saw. He had several things. Didn't you have on display there? I did, right. And, uh, oh, I remember for one thing you had some uh, Red hat ladies. Yes. Didn't you? Yes. Very striking, those red hats. And uh, he began to tell me then about his uh, project of taking uh, photos, mm -hmm. uh, camera shots, at Native American uh, celebrations and ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we talked more than 20 or 30 minutes before we had our book deal pretty much sealed. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I thought, you know, if he does those paintings, if he does paintings from the photo, photographs, which he was doing, why not write some poems to go with them? Great idea. So I, I think I suggested that we do that, and he just picked up on it immediately. And we went with it. Well, in my case, I was born in Oklahoma, the pan, Panhandle, raised in liberal Kansas, uh, went to the University of Kansas, became a sculpture major, and came to Wayne State College to teach culture. Well, I, I was raised in a little town in South Central Kansas and uh, got a degree at Emporia State University. Mm -hmm. uh, taught at Wichita State for four years. Then I came to Lincoln to work on a PhD at the University of Nebraska mm -hmm. and taught at Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked the town, I liked the school, and I stayed. Well, I think in my case, the, the, the open, relatively flat, I call it simple landscape, I think has had a, was a factor influencing the simplicity uh, of my paintings, um, simple directness. And I tend to work with simple shapes and try to make simple shapes work together to express complex ideas. Well, a major influence for me was a small town. The town I grew up in had only about 700 people in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, just an enormously important influence on, on my life. Uh, and I would say the, the rural uh, aspects of both uh, Nebraska and Kansas mm -hmm. have been important to me, even though I've lived in Lincoln. I consider Lincoln a major city, I mean, I, uh, in, in terms of, <laughs> of population and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, I don't know, there's an openness and there's a kind of grassroots, um, I don't know what to call it, kind of grassroots honesty, maybe that's not the best word, um, that, uh, that I like. Um, and I come back to that over and over again in my stories and in the poems. When I was, hadn't been out of college very long, people would ask me what inspires me to work, and in jest I would say GMAC, and that was the finance company that I made car payments to, and, and it was in jest. Well, I suppose in the early days it wasn't in jest, but I, I stayed with the story after it wasn't true. But in, in my case, I'm pretty good about, uh, I'm a morning person, I get up, I go to work, and I find it pretty easy just to make an appointment with my easel and show up. And uh, I tend to paint 45 minutes out of every hour. Paint for 45 and then for the next 15 I get away from the painting. I don't look back. And so when I do come back it's fresh. And often if there's problems I can recognize them immediately and get to solving them. I think there are probably several motivations. Uh, for, for me, one of them is that I, I, I try to figure out things for myself on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I try to figure out <coughs> attitudes, for example. 
uh, what is what is what is my honest attitude about something, mm -hmm. and uh, I just think that uh, I work out that attitude a little better when I confront the page. Um, it's easy to um, oh I don't know to talk glibly about something, but when you get, when you get down to brass tacks, when you get down to the page, um, maybe you tend to be a little bit more uh, just a little bit more honest. It's also a record too. It's a record of attitudes. Mm -hmm. When my daughter, older daughter, was born, I wrote a poem. Well, I wrote it later, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, th that's a record of her birth. It's a record of my attitude toward that event. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's kind of important to have. So that's one of many, many motivations. There, and I think there's a certain uh, satisfaction in, uh, in finishing something that you think might work. I mean, I, uh, Carlos, I, I can imagine you finishing a painting mm -hmm. and uh, finishing it the way you want it and yeah. saying, yeah, that's it. And, and don't you take some delight in that? I, and, and I think that's true. Uh, I certainly would if I were mm -hmm. a visual artist, if I could do what he does. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to finish a poem or a story uh, and work it over and believe that it's more or less there mm -hmm. uh, is, is, uh, is satisfying and to share that with other people. I think, uh, a motivation for me is probably light, and it's what light visually does to things, and that's what captivates me. And so I, I use the light to define what I'm doing, and, and in the end, it's all an abstraction thing that is, I think, a bit of trickery. Um, bringing colors and shapes together to convey ideas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the trick is to put the right shapes and the right colors and all together. Well, the book is called Still Life Moving, and the full-blown book is forthcoming. It uh, mm -hmm. is supposed to be here I've heard that. Uh, before I die. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did a little book, a little version of it mm -hmm. that looks like this. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it Still Life Moving, and that's the name of one of the, uh, one of the paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, our purpose was to, I, I think basically, was to, was to suggest the extent to which artworks can make connections. Mm -hmm. And readers then, in turn, can make connections with the art and with the written word. So if I had to use one word, it would be connections that we're trying to make here. Uh, the only explanation that we're giving uh, for what we're doing on the book goes like this. This booklet attempts to illustrate with words and paintings some of the connections that can be made between cultures even as they strive to keep their identities intact. Standing Bear said it best, my hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. But there can be joy also if the connections promote friendship, respect, and understanding. So you, you may look at one of the Carlos paintings, uh, for example. That one, for example. Mm -hmm. And say, well, <clears throat> he, took a, he took a picture, and then he edited that picture as he saw fit, mm -hmm. and this is what he came up with in his painting. Mm -hmm. That's the connection that he made with the photograph that he took. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and I make a connection. And the poem is what I come up with as a result of, of that. Mm -hmm. The reader in turn comes to the poem, looks at the painting, reads the poem, makes a connection, and perhaps then makes a connection of his own. So it's a matter of, because we're all in this together, and, and uh, uh, to make that kind of uh, related uh, actions and reactions is our purpose, at least as I see it. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if Carlos would uh, totally agree with that or not. Well, I find it interesting. Uh, Bill would share the part he had written to these, and I would go home and, and read them again and again, and the first time or two, they just kind of sailed my head, and the third or fourth reading, <laughs> they started to speak to me. And, and I learned to kind of trust my own interpretation. And it got to the point yeah. where I really didn't want anybody else's interpretation. Mm -hmm. I was 
satisfied with mine. Good evening. Thanks for coming out this evening to the Heritage Room. Um, my name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the room and also to the Ames Reading Series. We're really excited that this re uh, the Ames Reading Series has been around for more than 20 years now. So, and we actually have, I think, the 165th and 166th readers with us this evening. So, that's pretty cool. Um, we're here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection um, that's designed basically to promote and preserve works by and about Nebraska authors. We have about 13,000 volumes in the collection right now, written by more than 3,000 authors. And we also have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, artwork, and other memorabilia as well, as you can see around the room. We do invite you to come back to the Heritage Room when we're, room when we're open for regular public service hours to check out any of those things that I just mentioned. Um, we're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and Sundays in, uh, in the afternoon from 2 to 5. So come and see us. Obviously, we're located here at uh, Bennett Martin Library on the third floor, so. And since you got here, I know you know that. Um, we'd also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. Uh, we are able to bring special programs like these to you um, because they established an endowment some years ago with their volunteer efforts. Tonight, our readers are Bill Clefcorn and Carlos Fry. And they have collaborated on a book that's entitled Still Life Moving. Um, actually, we think there's a book. They say there's a book. And one of these days, <laughs> it'll actually come out. But we haven't actually seen the physical piece yet. Um, well, an earlier version of it. Um, I was looking for common threads in their lives, and I thought they were both born in Kansas. But I've now discovered that Carlos was born in Oklahoma. Nobody's perfect. Uh -oh. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. There you go. <laughs> anyway, they did both grow up in Kansas. He says he was only in Oklahoma until he was in third grade, I think. So That's it. It's, oh, it's okay. <laughs> I guess. But they did both grow up in Kansas, and they both knew, moved to Nebraska in the 60s. Carlos went to Wayne, and Bill came to Lincoln. And as an aside, I grew up in Wayne, and when I was in college, a family named Fry moved in next door. So I've actually known Carlos for quite a while here. <laughs> um, they are both artists. Carlos expresses his art through painting, although he's worked in a number of different medias over the years. And Bill shares his art through writing, mostly poetry, but other things too. He was named the Nebraska State Poet by the Unicameral in 1982. He's written a number of books, many of which are here. And he's worked extensively with children, too, which has generated, I think, probably a number of great stories that he could tell us. We're happy to have Bill and Carlos here with us this evening. Please help me welcome them. <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. It's nice to be here. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Uh, this is a, kind of a special evening for me because uh, it's a different project. Um, Carlos uh, and I collaborating on this uh, on this book. It's the first time I've ever done anything like this. I've always envied visual artists, but I've never worked with one uh, this closely. Uh, the uh, the book that was referred to that Meredith referred to, uh, the first book is kind of a baby book, uh, still life moving. Uh, this is a kind of chat book, uh, and it's a uh, an abbreviated form of the final book which we are hoping comes out uh, before we uh, die. <laughs> uh, we were told several times that it would be out no later than the middle of August, and um, that's already passed. Uh, the middle of September, and that has gone by. Uh, early in October, and that I think is history, but certainly by the middle, by the 16th of November. <laughs> Uh, does anyone see the book? <laughs> okay. Uh, the last word I had was that uh, it would be out in uh, two weeks. 
the check is in the mail. I met Carlos in Wayne uh, several years ago when I was uh, uh, killing some time. I went into a store and, and uh, Wayne uh, and uh, Carlos had his uh, easel and his materials out working in a section of that store. And uh, I was taken by the paintings immediately, uh, a variety of paintings. And uh, I went over and was looking at them when Carlos uh, stopped his work and came over and, and introduced himself and we began a conversation. And uh, uh, 30 or 40 minutes later, we had agreed to do a book together. Uh, I suggested that we take two years to do it. He would do the paintings, paintings that he would do from photographs that he had taken with his camera, his digital camera. He told me that he had taken something like 1,200 uh, pictures. Uh, and Carlos uh, does not exaggerate. And uh, he had narrowed that down, I think, to several hundred and was beginning to work on that project. And uh, I suggested that we try uh, putting some words together with those uh, paintings. Uh, I also suggested that we do it over a period of two years. He said no one year would be long enough. Uh, and before we had finished our conversation, we had settled on six months. <laughs> and uh, at the end of six months, we were finished thanks mainly to Carlos' uh, diligence and to his respect for deadlines. I had never met a visual artist who had a respect for uh, deadlines, uh, certainly not to the extent that Carlos uh, did. Uh, a very unusual artist uh, in that when he says something, he's not kidding, uh, unless he, of course, is, is kidding, <laughs> which is fairly, uh, fairly often. It was a delight to work with him. Uh, I'm going to let him uh, talk a little bit more about that. He's going to show us a series of um, images of paintings. Uh, some of them are uh, images from the, uh, uh, the work that he did, from the pictures that he took of Native American ceremonies and celebrations. That was our focus in the book. And uh, some of those, I think, are included in those that he's going to show you and talk a little bit uh, about. And then he will show you, uh, to close out our program, uh, half a dozen or so uh, images from the book, and I will read the poems to go along with them. And then if anybody has any questions or rebuttals, we'd be happy to, uh, <laughs> if you'll pardon the expression, uh, entertain them. My good friend Carlos. Well, and I, I certainly like that term, good friend. Boy, if you ever want to take on a project with a delightful person, you just pick Bill Clefcorn. One of the best experiences of my life. And uh, I've seriously talked about adopting him. <laughs> um, the, the tax deduction has certain appeal. And... Um, um, my, my background, I was a sculpture major in school and went to Wayne to teach sculpture at the college. After a couple of years, I gave it up to a friend of mine because we, we grew and needed another faculty member, so I gave him sculpture and I took on other things and among them was pottery and some painting, etc., etc. Well, I ended up doing my, I had a lot of interest in painting, so, uh, but I ended up doing a lot of painting, and uh, I put a few on here to show you. Uh, I ended up doing a lot of portraits. Uh, in fact, over the last 20 years, I don't even want to tell you how many I've done, but over 3,000. And uh, uh, I did uh, many of these at the Minnesota Renaissance Festival, where I would sit in tights and lacy shirts and all, and, uh, and I just beg people not to repeat that. <laughs> so, okay, next one. Uh, this would be somewhat typical of what I would do at the Renaissance Festival. And in uh, most cases, I'd have a live person sitting in front of me. Um, all of them started out live. Yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> uh, some would ask me, said, do you do caricatures? And I say, not intentionally. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, next one. Uh, 
in, in some cases, when the digital camera came along, of course, I was faced with doing people live at the festival, and of course, they had to sit for me, and, uh, and of course, they couldn't be at the festival. So at one point, when the digital camera came around, I was able to take photographs of them. I would print them off, paint from the photographs while they went to the festival. Now, the one you're seeing here with three people, I, I, did, I took three individual photographs, and then I composed it back together uh, on, the, on the painting surface. Okay, next one. Uh, in some cases, I did more elaborate paintings. This was not done during the festival days, but uh, in intervening weeks. Uh, but the more finished ones were, were quite a joy for me. Next. Uh, another one, this was quite finished for the type of things I was doing. Most of what I was doing were fairly loose and quick. Uh, this was anything but loose and quick. Okay, next. Uh, I did a lot of animals, and uh, do, do, uh, do I understand correctly there are more cat lovers than dog lovers? Is that true? Boy, you couldn't prove it by me at the festival. For every cat I did, I did 40 dogs. I don't know what it is, but okay, next. Uh, and uh, you see the, the, the one dog with the blue eye, the one blue eye and the one brown eye, I found that very fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, and these are ones that I would take with my digital camera. Uh, and there were two separate ones, and then I put them together. Uh, most often, people would bring me photographs of their dog and said, can you paint from this? Well, it would be a black dog against a cave. <laughs> and, you know, so you'd see two, two white eyes, and I'd say, oh, I don't think so. And, uh, so but the, with a digital camera, I could pull it off. Okay, next. Now, isn't that just the sweetest thing right there? Okay, next. Um, had a, a friend of mine uh, one time was, uh, I think it was a state architect for Minnesota. We had gone to school together, and when he was about ready to retire, he, he came out to the festival. He lived in Minneapolis, and uh, we got to visiting. He said, I think I'd like to have you do a mural on my wall. And so we got to visiting, and he said, I think bison is it. And so I had friends that raised bison. So I would go out and take a lot of photographs, and it distilled it down to this one. But I think the painting was about 12 feet wide and five or so high. But it, it hangs on his wall, and it was a fun project. OK, next. This was the place in this antique store that I was painting the, the day that Bill came in. Now, we have a slight uh, disagreement on the how we met and how this went. and. Uh, and I think I'm quite a bit younger, so I think mine's probably truer. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, I, so I was painting this day, and in a booth next to me, I could kind of see this man moving around. I looked up, and he had this silver hair, and he looked pretty good. And I thought, well, you know, I, I think we're talking moneyed person here. <laughs> and uh, so when he slowed down, I thought, well, you know, it's probably somebody I should talk to. So we got to visiting, and... Uh, Oh, I was painting some, uh, let's see what the next slide is. I was painting this painting right here the day he was there, and he said, said, my, you have a nice glow on those apples. I said, well, thank you. So we got to visiting, and I had an apron on that, that had my name on it. And he looked down, and he says, Carlos Fry. We said, I know who you are. And I said, and you are? Well, I'm William. No, I guess before that, I'd say, I said, uh, what is it you do? And he said, well, I'm a writer of sorts. <laughs> At any rate, then when he saw my name and Carlos Fry, and I said, William Clefcorn, well, I know who you are, too, because back in 1982, I had a show at the, uh, in the Elder Gallery at Wesleyan University. And when the show was over, they said, well, the new poet laureate, William Clefcorn, bought one of your paintings. So I knew his name from way back when. Uh, but didn't meet him at the time. So, so on this day uh, was our official meeting, but I felt like I'd known him for years and years. Okay, next. And, uh, and this is the painting that he bought. Now, I can't remember if this is the actual painting or a sketch that I did for it, but 
at any rate, it was the painting was quite small, and uh, and, Very expensive. and and and. Uh, <laughs> And, and he didn't pay enough for it. That's what I remember. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, <clears throat> there we are. And, and we wear name tags generally so people can tell us apart. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and I like to think of myself as, as the more handsome, but uh, I'm pretty much alone in that, aren't I? Pretty much, yeah. I okay, next. On, on this particular day, I, I said to Bill, I said, you know, I just came from three powwows where I took, it was 1,400 photographs, and uh, I'm going to be painting some Indians. And his next words were, let's do a book together. And my next words were, you're on. This happened in less than 10 seconds, I would say. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and some people have to work to get books agreed to. <laughs> and, uh, and then the rest has is, is just been pure pleasure. Um, and in my case, I, uh, I kind of committed to work in this antique store. I was walking the treadmill one morning and I thought, what am I going to paint next? And I thought, well, yeah, I think I'd like to do some still life. And I looked around my house and either I'd painted it or I didn't want to paint it. And I thought, well, a few days before I was in this antique store, and it had, it's a big store, it has 70 booze in it. 70. And I thought, well, you know, I wonder if they'd let me bring some of those things home to paint. And my next thought was, well, maybe they just let me paint down there. So the moment I suggested it, they started clearing out of space for me. And, and the next day I was in there painting. So, but I, I would go in, uh, I was in there about 10 every morning, and I'd paint till they closed at 5.30. And they were open seven days a week, and most, most days I was in there, and uh, particularly after we agreed to this. So, next. Uh, and if you've never been to a powwow, uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled with them. I think everyone should go. And uh, next one. Um, I, I just find the whole thing a beautiful experience, interesting people. I was particularly impressed with, how many have been to powwows? Any of you? Uh, you find it a good experience? Um, I was particularly impressed with the, with the youth. Uh, I didn't see any sassiness, any rowdiness, and, and I, don't, I, I frankly expected it the first time I went, and, but I'm so impressed. Okay, next one. Um, and of course you see, um, all ages, from little tots that do the dances to pretty elderly uh, people, all kind of dances. Next one. One of the dances that I was particularly impressed with the, is done by young, energetic teenage girls, and it's called Fancy Dance. And uh, I love it because of the, the ribbons, and they do a lot of spinning. And I found that I particularly liked it about four in the afternoon when the light would come down from above and it would catch these ribbons, the kind of the rim lighting of them. And so it ended up being a lot of my paintings came from uh, paintings done late in the afternoon. Next. And this, by the way, was a painting done from that last photo. Um, can you go back to it briefly? There you go. And you, you can see that uh, I was inspired by it, but I tried to breathe life into it, uh, put the, the rhythms of the dance into it that I didn't necessarily see in the photo. Okay, next. Next. Oh, that, yeah, this is, this is another dancer, and I did two different paintings from this particular one, and you'll see quite a difference. Next one. That's the first version. Uh, a lot of splash of colorful ribbon. Okay, the next one. Uh, quite a different version. Uh, this one almost has a stained glass feeling to me. Okay, next. And so that, that shows the original photograph to the left and that painting to the right. 
But this is kind of typical of, of what, I would, what I would do. I, I took the photograph and I was inspired by it. I had this connection that Bill likes to talk about and then I interpret. And sometimes I, uh, sometimes I would take these photographs to bed with me at night and kind of look at them and the next morning I'd kind of have a solution, a direction I wanted to take with it. And, and some people think that's pretty kinky, but it worked for me. Okay, okay next. Um, someone in this direction, I think the next one shows you the, the influence of this painting. To the right, you see there were three photographs that um, became the, in, the inspiration for this. Of course, that top one is uh, sky only. And then I think the middle one was an online uh, photograph that I found. I didn't have any uh, in my own collection. And then the bottom, I didn't know how I wanted to solve the bottom of the painting, but that particular one, although the shapes are not the same, I was influenced by it. Okay, and next. And which kind of led us to, to this one. And from here, I'll let Bill take back over. Well, we talked a little bit about how we might uh, put this uh, project together, and it finally boiled down to uh, uh, pretty much a single word, uh, connections, connections. Uh, Carlos is looking at, uh, let's see if I can find still life moving here in the baby version. So, so Carlos is looking at his, uh, uh, his picture that he had taken with his digital camera, and from that picture, he is editing, he is doing whatever artists do to portray his perception. So he comes up with this painting. I look at the painting until it makes some kind of connection with me. And the poem is an attempt not to explain the painting, but to dramatize my connection with the painting. And then I would hope that when the uh, reader, should this book ever appear, <laughs> has the book in hand and looks at the painting and reads the poem, can see the connection and hear the connection and then make a connection of his own, which is very, very important, I think. In order to enhance that uh, subject of connections, I used epigraphs. And I know that some of you, uh, probably many of you here, that do your own writing and use epigraphs from time to time. I borrowed lines, phrases, and so on from a variety of writers, and I would use those then uh, between the, uh, uh, the title and the poem. And uh, I used uh, uh, quotes from Native American poets, and Scott Mamaday, for example, from British poets, from American poets, uh, from uh, a variety, a wide variety, as wide as I, could, uh, as I could come up with. Because it seemed to me that the epigraph could further enhance this business of connections. Does that make sense? You know? It's interesting to me that somebody 800 years ago could be thinking somewhat the same thing that I'm thinking. And there is a connection. We thought about having a preface, but we decided that uh, that would be uh, too explanatory. So on the back of the book, that one of these days will appear, is this following uh, short paragraph. This book attempts to illustrate with words and paintings some of the connections that can be made between cultures even as they strive to keep their identities intact. Standing Bear said it best, my hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. But there can be joy also, if the connections promote friendship, respect, and understanding. Here are the words to go with still life moving. When I looked at the painting, it seemed to me that the youngster 
was deliberately posing. There is the, you know, we have the hands up like so. What do you do with your hands? Um, my grandmother uh, would always hold a hanky, a white hanky in one hand. So that hand was taken care of. And she'd have that at her side. And then she would have the other hand behind her, like so. Because my grandmother, if you're not doing anything with your hand, then get it out of sight. You know, she was very utilitarian, my grandmother was. And it just seemed to me that this youngster was, was posing. And I, I, I could remember how painful it was for me as a child to pose. We didn't take many pictures in my household, but when we did, it was an ordeal. And you had to hold still for upwards of two, three seconds. And um, just utter misery. So that when those two or three seconds were over, uh, then you could erupt and go about doing whatever mischief you had been doing when you were interrupted. Here's the poem, Still Life Moving. The epigraph is from Erica Funkhauser, a poem of hers called Still Life with Pewter Pitcher, and it goes like this. Who in the world is not waiting to be touched and filled? Love something your own size. Love the world. Here in pastel, I think most of Carlos' paintings are in pastel. Is that? That's correct. Here in past for this series. Here in pastel, you are no more in motion than is the pear beside the pitcher on the table. Pitcher and table no more in motion than the pear. Yet seeing you here immobile, we see likewise the form beyond the still life moving. Still life breathing beyond the stillness. And we remember how it was to be told to stand perfectly still for only a moment told not to move until the image by way of something magic was recorded. How good it felt when, after that interminable moment, we were told that the moment was over. How then, with one of our hands, we reached for the pear on the table, reached for the pitcher, too. How then we hurried to join our friends, who, with pitchers and pears, were moving and breathing as if nothing, not even the names on the scroll of the dead, could deplete them. And it seemed to me that the still life moving somehow fit um, and fits the, the Native American. Still life moving. Still, mm, maybe, but moving. Okay, next one. Next. This is an image of Standing Bear, and I don't, what did you use it for the model, Carlos? Um, it's probably a combination of about four photographs that I found. Um, four photographs of Standing Bear? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is his version of, of, uh, of Standing Bear. You all know the story of Standing Bear, I'm sure. Probably one of the most famous trials in the history of this country, if not the most famous, as a matter of fact. The ending of that trial declared the Native American a person with all the rights and privileges attendant thereunto. And though that has not come to fruition, it's still an important step. At his own trial, Standing Bear, in his own defense, said, and I quoted this a minute ago, I'm going to do it again because I use it as the epigraph. My hand is not, and you think of um, Sherlock and the Merchant of Venice, and I don't think probably Standing Bear had read the Merchant of Venice. My hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be of the same color as yours. I am a man. Standing Bear, blood. The night hawk gyres on what we cannot see but cannot live without. Call this simple truth likewise an acknowledgment of faith. To put, to, to put the test to what we knew as fact, my brother and I would hike to Shannon's Pond, where, naked, we'd hold our breasts to explore the wreckage of a misbegotten Hudson, 
hold them until our lungs were close to bursting. Then, with a timing always providential, we'd break the surface to inhale no more deeply than sweetly, my brother on one occasion bleeding from an artery, he having explored the Hudson and its shards too closely. And with a friend I helped to carry him back to town, blood between each twisting of the tourniquet, spurting, red and thick and communal. His blood, my blood, his blood, the blood of all of us yet breathing, all thick and red, all brothers. So that was my reaction to the, to the painting. One of the interesting things for me was that uh, I never knew where, where my viewing of the painting might take me. I just had no idea. So to, to look at that image and to be taken back to, uh, to the pond where my brother almost bled to death, uh, that strikes me as being a compelling uh, connection, especially in light of what Standing Bear said about communal blood. Next slide. Braids. <coughs> Braids. When I looked at the painting, that's what struck me most. Braids. And I'm not quite sure why. Um, but you don't have to explain why. It, it happens. Um, the, the, uh, the braids uh, seem to me almost dominant in, in, in that painting, though the colors are too, aren't they? But the, the braids, the braids. It could be because I have a granddaughter. Actually, I have seven granddaughters. But one of them has uh, exceptionally thick black hair. And braided, that hair is beyond, far beyond beautiful. And uh, um, maybe I had that in mind. I don't know. I use a, a quote from Stanley Kunitz, a poem of his called The Snakes of September. After all, he writes, we are partners in this land, co-signers of a covenant. At my touch, the wild braid of creation trembles. Braids. Is this too much to bargain for? The hope that all things woven and braided can somehow provide the covenant to make us partners in a land of multiple divisions? One answer lies in the bright routine of doing such braiding and such weaving as we have the skills to do. To dance then with our sacred arts intact, art done with hands that we exp extend by dancing, wearing, as we do, history and good intentions in our hair and on our shoulders, our movements those of many channels flowing among the many islands that serve to make the river what it is, joinings made possible by differences, union through the handiwork of hands. It's not only the product, it's not only the braid itself, but the fact that we, uh, that, that strands are being woven into braids, that uh, ind individual strands are being put into a kind of union to, to form the braids. And one of the uh, uh, Native American ceremonies involves hair, the washing of hair. Uh, it's a grieving ceremony uh, whereby the, the grievers, <coughs> having lost a loved one, uh, wash the grief, or rather comb, they comb the grief from their hair. A fascinating concept. Next, grass woman. A quote from The Way to Rainy Mountain by N. Scott Mamaday. Great green and yellow grasshoppers are everywhere in the tall grass, and tortoises crawl about on the red earth, going nowhere in the plenty of time. Isn't that a great line? I think it's a wonderful line. I'm going to use it, but I, for the title of a book I have not yet written, um, and probably never will. Uh, and maybe it's my age, uh, going nowhere in the plenty of time. As my brother said when he retired recently, I have so little to do and so much time 
in which to do it. This material, oh, this is a story she tells me. Uh, and the woman is a Pipestone, Minnesota. I guess I mentioned that in the poem, yeah. This material I am working with, she says, is the blood of ancestors that having soaked into the earth found its way to this place, to this quarry at the edge of Pipestone, Minnesota, where, hardened and layered, it waited patiently these many seasons to be returned to at last, to the realm of the living. Her voice is alto, delivering a chant, as with her fingers she rubs a miniature turtle to a high reddish sheen. When she seems satisfied, she looks at her handiwork and says, as if speaking to me through it, treat this always with reverence and respect, for it is sacred. Then, raising her eyes to meet mine, she says, this is my story, this is my song. Then she asks, are you a storyteller? Do you sing? I answer with a nod. Her eyes were green. Who was it that said God created people because he liked to hear stories? I don't know who it was, but I think he, she had it maybe right. <laughs> and they're not all great stories, but, but they're stories. But that was a fascinating. Have any of you been to Pipestone, Minnesota? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And back to hair. <clears throat> Next slide. I love this one. Isn't that some? And that painting is over here, right over here. These are uh, seven or eight of, Car of Carlos' paintings over by the, by the wall. If you afterwards would like to look at them more closely. <clears throat> of hair and the combing of hair. And this is another story that I borrow. Um, I borrow this one from a colleague of mine at Nebraska Wesleyan, where I taught for um, 40, yeah, 40 years. Mary Smith, Mary Daler Smith. Some of you, I'm sure, knew Mary Smith. Absolutely stunning and wonderful human being. When her mother lay dying, Mary would give me a report each day. How's your mom doing, I would say. Oh, she's not doing too well, Mary would say. And one morning she says, she'll not be alive tomorrow. And I said, did you talk with her last night? And she said, yes. She was coherent. She asked me a favor. I said, what was it? She said, Mary, would you comb my hair? And Mary then talked about combing her mother's hair. And so I stole that for this uh, poem. But my point in connection with the book is that when I looked at this, at this painting, I, uh, the connection it made with me was by way of the hair of this woman's hair. Just lovely, lovely white hair. Mary's mother had hair a good deal like that. The uh, epigraph is from Gladys Cardiff, a poem of hers called Combing. Bending, I bow my head and lay my hand upon her hair, combing, and think how women do this for each other. Of hair and the combing of hair. Here is a story my late friend Mary told me, story of hair and of the combing of hair, how her mother's last request was this, would you comb my hair? And she combed it, Mary said, combed its whiteness into a compliance so soft to the touch that she touched it again and again. And her mother, with her bird frail fingers, reached to touch it also. And at the touch, her mother smiled, Mary said, and that was it hair and the combing of hair, and the touching of hair with the tips of one's fingers. And that was the story my late friend Mary told me. There might be a little bit of envy in that poem in the sense that I, I don't believe we males do that very much for each other. 
we don't comb each other's hair. Every time I ask Carlos to comb my hair, he, um, he frowns. Um, but women comb each other's hair, and, and it's, it's a kind of communion that they have that we don't have, Bus. I don't know why. I don't know why. But I've always sort of admired and envied that uh, at the same time. He said his hair is rented. <laughs> I hope you're not paying a lot. <laughs> uh, oh, that's, that's, that has to be real hair. Next. You know, sometimes the, uh, the connections are so, I don't know, uh, obtuse that it's kind of embarrassing to to admit to them, but, but, but they happen, they happen. And, and when I saw this painting, Proud, um, it somehow reminded me of my sister, my older sister. Uh, and, and I think it, it's, the, um, it's the way that the, that, that, the, um, that the figure is standing, Proud. It just seems like the individual, uh, by way of her stance, suggests pride. And then I thought, that's the way. my sister stands that she walks that way, she walks with a good deal of pride. Now, now maybe she has, uh, you know, maybe there's something, um, maybe that has something to do with her lower lumbar. <laughs> um, in fact, um, but um, it just seems to me that it's pride. I borrowed some lines from Mari Sandoz. A book of hers called "These Were the Sioux." Be dutiful, respectful, gentle, and modest, my daughter, and proud walking. That's some advice given to a young Sioux girl upon the girls becoming a woman. Be dutiful, respectful, gentle, and modest, my daughter, and proud walking. Proud. And this also, quote, no people goes down until their women are weak and dishonored, or dead upon the ground. And I remember watching my sister, dutiful, respectful, gentle, and modest, and proud, walking, as she cleared the counter in my parents' cafe, cups in one hand, plates stacked halfway to heaven in the other, watched her balance these towers of porcelain all the way to the kitchen, her body certain and upright and so newly woman, it made me remarkably proud to watch it. My own body too young to know, beyond feeling, what bodies might do when the time comes for doing. Death and dishonor not possible in my parents' cafe, where my sister cleared the counter and where, returning from the kitchen and wiping her hands on a sky-blue apron, she winked as a mother might wink at a child at her unleavened brother. A certain friskiness there, you know. She not only made it back to the kitchen without dropping those mounds of porcelain, you know, but she comes back and in her salty way gives you a wink, you know, you know. That's a part of the pride also. Next. Carlos' uh, 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 paintings are so diverse. Um, this is one of the, the one he showed you a, a few minutes ago of the dancer, um, and he said uh, somewhat suggesting, uh, suggestive of a, um, of a painted window, of a, a stained glass window, a kind of a, a semi-surrealistic rendition. And this is another that fits into that category, where, uh, and I have no idea how he arrived at this, but uh, to accent what he accents and to de-accent, if there is such a word, um, the rest, giving it all a kind of watery feeling for me. A very, very unusual uh, perception that is revealed in that, uh, in that painting. I call the poem River. And the epigraph is from Denise Lowe, who is a Kansas poet. Uh, Carlos uh, went, 
we were told as far as the third grade, we are through the third grade in Oklahoma. And uh, I can remember having been born and raised in Kansas, uh, we were told that we were both, uh, we both pretty much grew up in Kansas. Um, and I appreciate that. That is to say the possibility that one can grow up in, uh, in Kansas. Um, <laughs> and we were very, very poor. And it was during the Depression, the Great Depression. And, um, and every morning, no matter how poor we were, we could get up and look out the window to the south and say, well, don't know what we're going to have for breakfast, but at least we don't live in Alva. <laughs> and I suppose that uh, Carlos, uh, you know, in the third grade was looking out the window thinking, well, don't know what I'm going to have for supper, but at least I'm not living in Attica, Kansas. <laughs> it's called River. The epigraph from Denise Lowe is, uh, and it's a poem of hers called Learning the Language of Rivers. I have no word, she writes, I have no word for the river living inside me. River. Because I cannot name it, this river living inside me, I can only respond to its movements. And because they are both incessant and eternal, what must I conclude? That I too am incessant and eternal? That at night, no less than in daylight, it bends to bend again to wherever the everlasting leads it. And in my dreams, the serpent that is its lean configuration would pose the question to which the answer is this. Water. The body is mostly water. Now we tried to touch on a number of subjects that are dear, if not in fact sacred to Native Americans. Grass, water, sky, earth. The, uh, uh, the earth lodge that we saw a few minutes ago. And the last one is, uh, the last one is called Shapes. And the epigraph is from a poet named Ray A. Young Bear. The poem of his called Grandmother. If I were to see her shape from a mile away, I'd know so quickly that it would be her. And I thought of my maternal grandmother. Yeah. Uh, I think I would know her from a great distance uh, also. The way she carried herself, her shape, she was reasonably square. Um, she came to this country from Germany when she was 17 to visit her brother who had come here looking for work and uh, found him and also found grandfather. So she never went back. Shapes. No two shapes precisely alike, yes. But it is not the shape alone that defines her it is the attitude within the shape. Attitude that moves the shape with such distinctiveness that no one who has spent his young life with her dare mistake. On New Year's Eve, we'd sit and play Parcheesi until at the stroke of midnight, half drunk on apples and popcorn and lemonade, we'd rise to do a little dance around the table, hands over the table almost touching. Grandmother's short, wide body moving with an attitude I'd recognize a country mile away. She in toeless cotton hose on tiptoe with her grandson, bringing in the hope of another year, another month or week. Great God above earth spirit here below another day. So that's a sampling of what we, uh, of, of, of what we came up with.